schooner sails, to the porthole windows, to the docking facilities, even the spiral staircase kind of looks like rigging. Everything has a nautical theme. Harry was an architect, and one of his interns from back then took my tour last year and said, you know, Harry was also building his own boat, which makes perfect sense because I knew Harry was a sailor, and he was the biggest proponent I can think of of wanting to see the return of residential living right downtown along the river. We'll talk about that in a minute. Right now, let's tip our hats to Blommer Chocolate Factory. They're baking today. Can you smell that? Yeah. They're up at the corner of Milwaukee uh, and Kinsey Street. If you lived over here, you wake up to that three or four times a week. But you see, living downtown, we see it today. We witness it with newer developments like the 500 condos of Kinsey Park on our left from 2001. But living right in the heart of the city along this river fell off for a good 100 years after the fire. Well, Harry Weiss knew it would come back. He would say, water is a magnet. It draws people to it. I think Harry realized that deep within our collective unconscious, we human beings seem to long for the sea, the original source. And if you don't have an ocean at home, my friends, often a river is enough if you want to listen to what that river has to say. Now, why would residential living actually fall off for so long? Well, it was two big reasons. Number one, remember after the fire, they passed that word and you couldn't rebuild with wood. We know most people, residentially speaking, couldn't afford brick or steel in the 1800s. If you could only rebuild with wood, you had to get out of Dodge, so to speak. You had to build outside the city limits. That wasn't that far. I could take you a little bit north of DePaul University. On the north, uh, near, a little bit northwest of DePaul, there are still a lot of three flats made of wood because that was outside the city limits at the time. Now, there was a second reason residential living downtown fell off. The river! Quite frankly, nobody really wanted to live along the river for a long time. It was still a polluted mess right up into the 1970s. And I probably should admit it's not exactly a picnic yet. I wouldn't suggest trying to swim in this water. You can go kayaking. I canoe on the Chicago River, but uh, just take a really good shower when you're done. Now that Chicago Ship and Sanitary Canal I talked about earlier, that amazing engineering project that reversed the current of the Chicago River sending our pollution to St. Louis. It took eight years to dig. It took out more dirt than the Panama Canal. As a matter of fact, you couldn't have done the Panama Canal without Chicago because the Army Corps of Engineers supervisors developed techniques here called the Chicago School of Earth Moving, and that's the knowledge they took down to Panama. So you have all this amazing engineering going on, but did they solve the pollution? No. We were still dumping everything right into the river in 1900. We are just hoping the good people of St. Louis would deal with it. Who knew the good people of St. Louis would be somewhat offended and sue Chicago in federal court in 1900 for reversing the river. Well, everything turned out fine during the trial. A University of Illinois chemistry professor proved to the federal judge in that case no worries. As the polluted Chicago waters flow south, the sun would burn off that bad, nasty bacteria. Sediment and dirt would drop out along the way. By the time the dirty water made it to St. Louis, therefore, i.e. to wit and lewis, so fact though, that water should be clean again kind of, sort of, maybe. That's kind of how they left it after the trial. Actually, you know, I'm reading a book called The Great Lakes Water Wars. It's a book about water management in the 21st century. They go in depth in that trial, and it went back and forth with suits and countersuits for a while, and then it looked like everybody just decided to blame Peoria. Because actually, there were meatpacking plants in Peoria between us. Well, fortunately for all these cities, the river is cleaner a bit today than it was in uh, 100 years ago. In fact, in 1993, the EPA said we didn't have to call the river toxic, just call it very polluted. Okay, that doesn't sound very healthy, but you're talking about a river that was a dumping ground for industry and an open sewer for so long, we're still using a combined storm drain sewer system in Chicago. But changes did begin to take place. The river, very slowly but surely, is getting a little bit cleaner, and this is because of the, a lot of it's because of the urban waterways design project of 1990. You know what? We quit treating the river like a back alley, started thinking of embracing it like a second lakefront. We took a clue from San Antonio, started creating the river walk downtown. Cleanup projects are underway today, and there's some places where you aerate the Chicago River. If you get more oxygen in, this has seen the return of species of fish and wildlife. Now, last summer, the federal EPA has suggested to Chicago, and Chicago's talking about this, making the Chicago River a recreational swimming destination. I don't want you to try that on your own. Come back and see me next year. I'll let you know how that's going. Right now, though, look at the pilings below the Yellow Bridge House at Kinsey Street. They caused an economic disaster, the Great Chicago Flood of 1992. Those pilings were put in the wrong place. Don't blame the workers. They had outdated maps. Nobody told them that when they pounded the pilings in, boom, they were right on top of the 60 miles of long-abandoned underground railroad tunnels in Chicago. Back in 1899, 
the Illinois Telegraph and Telephone Line people have this great idea, a miniature locomotive train to get around the traffic problem. Yeah, build it under the river and underground. They were afraid the mayor wouldn't let them do it. So they dug the entire 60 miles anyway. People would go down there and go, boy, that's a lot of telegraph wire. You could put a hay wagon in here. And they were like, nope, nothing to see here. So when they completed the entire tunnel system, then they showed it to the mayor and they said, what do you think? We were, we were thinking maybe putting a train in and that's how they did it but they kind of went in surreptitiously like that well those tunnels were used right up until 1959 they're abandoned now but cable guys go down there so it was a cable guy in january 1992 he's laying cable in that old underground train tunnel system and the pilings where they're cracked the river water comes leaking in i don't know maybe he said whoa dude better report that well that's how my cable guy would say it at any rate, the city was informed of the problem. Chicago had advance warning to award what should have been about a $10,000 repair job estimated. Patch a leak in the story didn't go quite so smooth. For one thing, they didn't get around to it right away. By April 1992, they did have a drilling company down there. But on the morning of April 13th, something went terribly wrong, and a whirlpool appeared in the Chicago River just like your bathtub drain. Only in this case, a quarter billion gallons of murky Chicago River water was sucked into that drain, and it filled up the tunnel system, flooding every building from the Merchandise Mart to the Board of Trade. You know, I remember riding my bicycle downtown when that happened. I didn't see that water in the streets. It was kind of invisible flood. It was all in the tunnels. I saw fire trucks, hoses, sump pumps. They were even throwing mattresses into the hole to sop up the water. A big mess for the city of Chicago and the cost of procrastination. An estimated $10,000 repair job, but they jumped on things too sweet. It cost Chicago instead of billion dollars to clean that up, the great Chicago flood. And after that, there was an inspector of tunnels who was no longer an inspector of tunnels. Now, coming up on our left, they're doing some work right now. I'd still take a picture of the Great Lakes building 1912 covered with ivy. Because not only is this a good example of the Chicago School Warehouse, but if you go around the back of this building on the street, you might be able to locate a little plaque that would say that this corner on the river held the wigwam in 1860. The wigwam was a rickety wood building put up in only five weeks to host one event, the Republican National Convention. My friends here on the banks of the Chicago River is where Mr. Abraham Lincoln received the nomination to run for the presidency. Lincoln did not actually attend the convention. They'd already put him on the train to Washington at the time. And right where you see the metro train right now, it's going to course through the ground floor of one of the buildings, uh, not the highest clock tower on the planet, but one of the highest clock towers on the planet. This is the building building, Perkins and Wall, 1990, Ralph Johnson architect. I call it postmodern, leaning towards those early European modernist designs. Original client for this building was a salt company from Chicago, Morton. You remember Morton Salt? When it rains, it pours. Now this is an air rights project. Literally, it's built on stilts over operating train tracks. The railroads own all the prime riverfront land in downtown Chicago, and that was no accident. No, that was a calculated hustle in the 1800s to make Chicago the railroad hub of America. You couldn't take a single train from New York to California back in the day. You had to change trains in Chicago. And if you got off a train in Chicago, lo and behold, your wallet, your pocketbook got lighter. You got breakfast, lunch, a hotel room. You left a little jack, a little money behind. Air rights essentially means you have the right to buy the air from the railroad. Buy as much air as you want, but you have to stay out of the way. Problem. Far corner of this building overhangs a switching yard. Twelve floors, 55 by 150 square feet. What do you do with that weight if you can't support it from the ground? You lift it up from the ceiling using what is known as a cantilever, meaning that rolled steel truss on top of the building. Like a giant arm, it's reaching out, it's holding up 12 floors. The train will then go under the Art Deco Chicago Daily News building on our right. First building to jump the river. First building to make use of a public plaza downtown as well. Now Art Deco is also the style of the Civic Opera Building on our left. I often think of the Civic Opera Building as a perfect marriage of pragmatism and art. You start with a 3,500 seat opera house, but really pragmatically, you surround it with corporate towers so you have revenue coming in. Chicago's Lyric Opera is now housed in the Civic Opera Building. Hey, here's a bit of forgotten Chicago history. Madison Street above your head. Did you know this was the coolest, hippest neighborhood in America back in 1905? Yep, this area was called Hobohemia, a working class intellectual district of hobos, artists, anarchists, and wobblies, the industrial workers 
members of the world fighting for one big union. They got an education when Dr. Ben Reitman, protege and lover to anarchist Emma Goldman, opened a hobo college. You'd hop afraid into town, hear a University of Chicago professor give a lecture, pick up your hobo college diploma. I got a copy at home. That was replaced in the 1920s by the Dill Pickle Club. You might actually run into the poet Carl Sandburg, the writer Juna Barnes, the dancer Catherine Dunham, the boxer Mr. Jack Johnson, or that lawyer fellow who was hanging around, Clarence Darrow. Now the Dill Pickle replaced by the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think, oh, they'll have a lecture Saturday night, you're all invited. It's open to the public. Now at the end of that lecture, during the rebuttal period, anybody in the house, any age, can take the podium and have their say for three minutes. Just remember, if you should go, they never stopped following the Hobo College motto from the 1900s. You never interrupt another speaker. They're all, they always say, please, it should really only be one fool at a time. And if you want to go to that lecture series, talk to me after the tour. On a point now, we're passing the Hobo Union Station. You'll find travertine ceiling, fluted Corinthian columns throughout. Movie fans, remember the baby carriage bouncing down the steps of Union Station and the Untouchables, directed by Brian De Palma. And if you want to get your kicks on Route 66, it's right above Adam Street in Chicago. Here's a photo op for later. You have to stand on the bridge and take a picture of Union Station at the crossing guard up there because they even hung a Highway 66 road marker on it so you can get a cool photo. Come back over by Shoreline Water Taxi. Gotta go now. Docking at 200 South Wacker on our left. And then you'll be ready for the tallest building in America, the eighth tallest in the world today. On our left, the Willis, formerly Sears Tower. Architect Bruce Graham and from Bangladesh. First engineering partner for Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, Dr. Fazla Khan. Wave at the people in the skybox on the 103rd floor. They can see you. It has a glass floor. Enter it. Man, you're 103 floors up. You're walking on air. Have a fear of heights vertigo. Man, you're 103 floors up. You're heaving in the air. Don't look down. Now, three years ago, London-based insurance company, the Willis Group, takes over three floors of the 110-story Sears Tower. That's a lot less than 51% of the building, but they were given naming rights. I honor the new name. However, I'm a Chicagoan, and I'm a star of Mr. Richard Sears and Mr. Alva Roebuck, and the long tradition Sears once had in the city, they who built the building in 74. So when we turn the boat around, I will announce that building again. We have a better photo opportunity, but I will call it, as most Chicagoans I know still do, the Sears Tower. And because I'm multitasking today, I do have to practice my musical technique from Kazil in Tuva, in double note throat singing. So when I say Sears later, just know I'll be using the Tuva throat singing technique of Sigit or bird song. Well, you know, as opposed to the more common Tuva technique and throat singing of Kavadira, or frog style. Hey, cinema fans, you recognize the old Chicago Central Post Office on the right? Art modern in style. Did you see the Batman movie before he was rising like yeast, the Dark Knight? This was the Gotham City Bank in that earlier one. It also showed up in the robot movie Transformers 3. We can only hope they'll make a Transformers 4. Why on earth did we need such a gigantic building, though, to handle the mail back in 1921? I'll put forth an argument. The mail order catalog business, I would argue, was invented in Chicago in 1872. The first person to totally do mail order was probably A. Montgomery Ward, the catalog king, friend of the farmer. Probably wasn't a farm kitchen table in America back in the day that didn't have that big old Montgomery Ward catalog on the sideboard. Last year's catalog, well, that was out back for other uses. But even without those big companies, we would build a giant post office. Chicago's kind of always been the great American city of exaggeration. We're kind of a kid with a chip on our shoulder. Go ahead, do it big. Chicago, give it to you bigger. 1921, that old post office, largest on earth, 2.7 million square feet. Boo, yeah. But the truth of the matter is, elevators slow things down. Waiting for elevators? It's kind of like waiting for Godot. You know, you don't know if they're going to show up or not. So look at the new headquarters. Well, not new today. It's 1994, but it's newer than the old building. Um, this is Knight & Associates, 1994. They started consolidating operations on single floors for more efficient use of space. The old building was abandoned in 1995. Achieving landmark status, it just sold at public auction last summer for $24.8 million to a man reported to be one of the richest men in England, the Mr. Bill Davies, who's talking about turning it into a high-end fashion mall, putting up a 2,000-foot hotel. Supposedly, he's lined up $3.5 billion in financing over 10 years. He's going to turn this entire area, he says, into a worldwide shopping destination.
because as you know, the world is suffering from a shortage of worldwide shopping destinations. <laughs> so I'm, cur I'm curious to see how much of that's going to come to fruition. Oh, on our left, look at the skyline drop off because the business district is behind us now. And realize this, the loop, the original business district had borders. The river was northern border, the lake was eastern border, south and west railroad tracks. But if you were in business, you wanted to be downtown where the action was. Think of it this way, especially my younger passengers. Try to think way back before cell phones, before email, even before text messaging. Remember when business was the art of the handshake, the deal? You met your customer, not Facebook to Facebook, but face to face, you had two human beings in the same room. OMG, can you even imagine this LOL send? <laughs> we had no choice in Chicago. We couldn't sprawl out. We had to sprawl out. And that's why so many innovations in what is known as the vertical city came out of Chicago. Oh, a tip of the hat to Mr. Otis every single day. Without the Otis elevator, we'd all be on the first floor. Did you know the Otis elevator headquarters? in Minneapolis, Minnesota is actually only a one-story building. That's my definition of irony for today. Hey, can you tell me the architect of, uh, excuse me, the architect of River City? I bet you can. Your clue is in the curvilinear design. It's Goldberg, Bertram Goldberg again, right? Who did those corncob-shaped Marina City Towers we saw at the beginning of the tour. As much sculptor as architect expressionistic in his work, Goldberg was the modernist who thought outside the box. He wrote in his journal in the 60s while his teacher Mies van der Rohe and his peers were doing all those boxes. He was writing things like, I am in rebellion against the straight line. I refuse to remake humanity in the image of a machine. So he's inspired by nature, a snake. River City would have looked quite serpentine had it been completed with all five buildings planned. A free thinker dancing to his own different drummer. I think of Bertrand Goldberg up there with Antonio Gaudi. I see a similarity in their process, maybe an influence. On our right, you see that radio tower and the squat building sitting with an orange wall on its eastern front? That's the Chicago Fire Academy over on the Colvin Street where firemen get their training. Now where do you think they built the Fire Academy, boy? Oh, <laughs> but right on top of Patrick and Catherine O'Leary's farm. <laughs> firemen get their training where Daisy the cow that ornery heifer kicked over the kerosene lantern and almost destroyed us all in 1871. Or did she? Yes, the fire started right there, but let's clear something up. Forgive the cow. Daisy was framed, man. She was a smart cow. She got out of that barn to live another day. No one really knows how the great Chicago fire started. My favorite theory, meteor shower. <laughs> you know that's not so crazy? Four fires October 8, 1871. Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin. We'll never know for sure, but we do know about the cow story. It was made up by a couple newspaper cats. And one of them, Michael A. Hearn of the Tribune, admitted it in 1893. Made up the story, blamed that cow to sell more newspapers. It turns out that back then, the press, 